that this uh, three Supreme Court judges, well, former uh, Supreme Court judges, joining 600 other legal minds of the great and the good, uh, telling the UK government that, well, actually, you shouldn't be uh, uh, supporting Israel. You should not be uh, giving them arms uh, because you may be in breach of international law, as they fear, they say, potential violations of the Genocide Convention. Oh, joining me right now to run through that and all the other top stories of the day is Conservative commentator Benedict Spence. Good morning to you. Good morning. Thanks so much for joining us. Um, yeah, these Supreme Court judges, I mean, <clears throat> I have to say, when I saw the names of the judges uh, making this comment, I, I, I did think, oh, usual suspects, frankly. Mm. Uh, usual, but not, not you know, what, what a surprise. Um, but, but actually, you know, the fact that it involves Lord Sumption, who, again, who was a fantastic force for mm. sanity, anti-lockdown, not just, you know, Baroness Hale, of course, you know, Ramona-in-chief, Mm. Uh, 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 style Baroness Hale. Um, I, I thought actually had you know it was a range of people, a range of judges, a range of opinion um, who 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 had these views. But with you know six hundred legal experts, including three former Supreme Court judges, telling the government mm. you shouldn't be selling arms to Israel um, because you basically have a duty that they cannot be used you know in civilian attacks. Uh, and they said that we must um, end weapon sales to avoid UK complicity in grave breaches of international law, including potential violations of the genocide convention. Do you think those judges are right? I mean, they might have a point, but this is all a hypothetical. It's they might be in, in you know, it, it contravening yeah. a genocide convention. There isn't actually, there hasn't been a concluded investigation that says definitively that it has or hasn't happened. Um, you know, we had the ruling earlier uh, that said that Israel had to do its utmost to prevent things that could lead to genocide. And lots of people said, ah, that's proof that there's, there's genocide going on. Yeah. That's not, in fact, what it says at all. This is a very cautious approach. And you can understand why uh, legal experts might take that approach because that is their job. Uh, but I think broadly, more broadly, in the geopolitical uh, landscape of things, the first thing to say is we actually deliver a really small amount, number of uh, weapons to Israel. And we have been doing it for a very long I time. I mean, we are talking about less than 0.1%, mm. I mm. think, of of our arms that uh, are sent to Israel, or, 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 is, or of Israel's arms, mm. um, are provided by us. So to a certain extent, this is kind of, you know, a, one of those sort of virtue signalling token gestures. It's kind of meaningless, but won't we all feel good and pat ourselves on the back and go to dinner parties and say, look, I did that? Yeah, the only thing that it'll, that it'll actually affect is, A, we might, well, I say we, some people, some people in the UK might feel better about themselves, and we will have caused a diplomatic incident with our most important ally in the region at a time that it's going yeah. through a very serious it's, political It's the message that it crisis. sends to Israel's enemies. Yes, that, that, we, can be, that we can be strong-armed, basically, like that. And I yeah. mean, the, the thing is, we also, as you say, it's very small amount of weapons that we send. Think of all the other countries that are continuing to send uh, weapons without any such qualms. The United States perhaps being mm. the biggest example. If the United States isn't too bothered, I don't really see why we should be too bothered ultimately. But why do we take this attitude that almost every other country can look at international law and go, oh, well, that's unfortunate, may or may not happen, but it's not actually going to affect yeah. what we do. But Britain alone goes, well, we better wring our hands and not do anything in case we break But, but again, these would be, I mean, I don't know what their exact views were, but I'm guessing mm. a lot of these 600 legal experts, including certainly at least one or two of these Supreme, former Supreme Court judges, would have been the sort of people who very likely said, oh, we shouldn't get involved in Syria. Quite happy to watch Assad mm. murder systematically murder his own people. Mm. Uh, no, that was fine, don't get involved. But I would have thought actually the most moral thing, I mean, I certainly argued it at the time, was that we should get involved. Um, these are the people who, I know, I know, have we, I know we don't sell arms to North Korea and everything, but you know, we talk about like genocide. You know, the North Korean leader, Kim Jong-un, you know, systematically starves his people and keeps them at subsistence level mm. where people, mm. you know, it's the only country where people are getting shorter because of the malnutrition. But no, I, I don't see any, I just don't see any big, you know, big important letters to the government on that. Everyone seems to pick and I don't remember them writing about, you know, Yemen, and we sell well, arms Britain, to the Saudis. Britain, Britain has a very close relationship with Azerbaijan, which has committed ethnic cleansing against the Armenians and plans and to continue And blatantly and openly. So, and you notice there are no marches across central London for that because nobody cares about the and Armenians. And again, we, I always <laughs> ask, I, look, we should hold our own mm. government and every government to account mm. in the same way you know, that we hold you know, terrorist groups like Hamas to account. But the thing that always gets me in all of these things is, is the, the great and the good piling in at any and everything that Israel does. Now, a lot of the reports, mm. as, as, um, uh, some of the BBC reports in the last couple of days saying, look, you know, we are at a level of you know, malnutrition and starvation among civilians in, in Gaza that is absolutely unacceptable. And we should absolutely be acting on, on mm. if there is evidence of that, we should be acting on it. However, um, the idea that we should hold Israel 
God, I know I've banged on about this for a long time, guys, mm. but I mean, it's, it's a six-month anniversary this Sunday mm. of that terrible attack on October the 7th. But the idea that, that we should we should be holding Israel to a higher standard than we hold our own government. I don't remember this level of farce over us um, killing numerous civilians when we were going after al-Qaeda, mm. when we were going after ISIS. Um, you know, I, I, these people did not seem so concerned. Why is it, I ask the question virtually every day, why is it that people are so concerned yeah. whenever it involves Israel? Uh, well, um, it's anti-Semitism is the answer. Is the answer to and that. I'm not it saying is, these people are anti-Semitic, but there is just... I've got to be honest with For you. Legal even, even if people are not sort of consciously anti-Semitic, I think that there is this idea that yeah. the Jewish state gets, a, you know, it, that, that you are allowed to say things about the Jewish state that you're not allowed to say about other kinds of countries, and you're not allowed to say about other minorities, and that's because they don't conform to what a minority is supposed to be. Yeah. They are not oppressed. They are not victims. They do not sort of sit there and lie down and go, "Woe is me." It is that the Jewish communities around the world have gone from a position of being victimized to being assertive and taking control of their own destiny, and a lot of people don't like that because it doesn't correspond with what their view of what a minority ought yeah. to be. I think that's what, I don't think it's conscious they dislike Jews. No. I think it's an uncomfortableness with the idea of a state asserting its its nationality, yeah. but, its identity. But there is, look, there is, a, there is an issue in terms mm. of how this, this war is being perpetrated. Yeah. I've got, again, no issue with uh, Israel's right of self-defence. They've got every right to do that too. I, and, you know, it is Hamas that is mm. creating this problem. If Hamas hadn't launched that assault on October the 7th, there would be no bomb bombing of mm. Israel and no cutting sure. off of aid supplies. That is a simple matter. And everyone can say, oh, well, it started back in, you know, 1945, or it started back 2000 years ago. Mm. Yeah, but the fact of the matter is, there would be no bombing right now yeah. God, that would, if October 7th hadn't happened. I don't know when people say that Israel has a right of self-defense, but what right. is the but? What is the proportionate response? How, I mean, you know, again, we had a, a caller mm. yesterday on the show, um, you know, you know, a concerned, good person wasn't, you know, no one wants innocent people to die. However, it is Hamas who yeah. have taken those hostages and carried out that massacre. It is Hamas that can release those hostages. Today, Hamas could release all of the hostages, mm. lay down their weapons, end of, the whole thing's over the today. Mm. But they won't do that. But why are the demands always on Israel and not on this terrorist entity, which has created this issue. I mean, as I say, I've given a few reasons, but I think that there's also in the West, people have forgotten, ordinary members of the public have forgotten what wars are and what they involve. People die. Have, yes, I mean, look, let's put it this way. Did anybody feel any great sympathy for Germany after it invaded its neighbors multiple times over the course of a century, kept losing, kept losing its territory as a result of that? And its people were, let's be clear, its people were brutalized by, yeah. the, by the Soviets, by the Russians, by the French in many cases. Yeah. Nobody sheds any tears for the Germans now. Why? Because they, 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 did, they did something very stupid, again, which was invade their neighbours. Yeah. Well, okay, yes, but this, well, you but this is the trouble, the civilians... But that's, but that's every yes. war is like that. You know, yeah. The Mongols did not invade Europe because every single Mongol as one went, yes, we're going to terrorise all of Europe. That's not how it works. It is the leadership. But that is how wars work. And there are always civilian casualties. And this idea that it is only, that, you know, Gaza is unique in yeah. the history of warfare, it but, isn't. But, no, it's but, oh, but a lot of the claims currently are that it is unique in terms of the level of civilian deaths. Now, but again, no. those civilian deaths are only being counted by the Hamas controlled health ministry and yeah. this idea that 70% of, of those who are dying are women and children you think well ha more than half of the population of Gaza are children okay you know and half the population are women and half are men those statistics are not unusual or weird or in me to me to my mind particularly troubling I mean, other than I don't want anybody to die. I don't want an innocent man to die. No. I don't know why we care more about women than men. Yeah. Um, I really don't think that our lives are worse more than men. But it is, you know, it is the case that, you know, that the, the, the people dying... With, but Hamas deliberately keep people in mm -hmm. areas which are, uh, Israelis have asked them to evacuate so that they can take out the Hamas fighters. But when Israel says, you need to evacuate and get out of that area so we can go in and tackle Hamas fighters, mm -hmm. everyone's up in arms about that. Now, I do have issues about, uh, about bombing of, you know, refugee camps. I do have an issue in terms of, I, I, think, the, I think the Israelis have got every right to go into Rafah, mm -hmm. but we need to make sure it is safe for civilians. But they are doing that. That's why at the start of the war, they didn't go straight in. They waited for weeks for people to move, for people to evacuate. And that's why they're waiting now for people they gave to move They, they from gave Rafa. 24 hours and yeah, then they waited two longer. weeks. Yes, yeah. they, waited, yeah. they waited. They gave people far more time than the average military would actually give people We'd, to we've on, never a done that. on a revenge mission, because no. that's what this is ultimately. Okay. And it's a justified one. But again, the, you don't see the same standards applied to all kinds of other conflicts right now. You know, the, the, perhaps the big example is Ukraine. Before the actual Russian invasion, 
there was a lot of bad things happening in Donbass between the Ukrainians and the Russians. Nobody sheds tears about that right now because nope. they understand what a war is. Yeah, indeed. Well, I want to hear from you. We've had our, uh, our, our, our chat about it. Today, we are asking, as three former Supreme Court judges have told the government to end arms sales to Israel or risk breaching international law, what is your reaction? Give us a call, 03444-499-1000. You can text on 8722 or get in touch on X at Talk TV. Calls are charged at the national rate. Text costs one standard network rate message. Um, Let's go to uh, another uh, interesting story. The front page of The Sun today, it's an interview. It was actually the one that uh, took place in this studio at the time of my show. We were up in the, uh, the radio studios instead. Um, but Rishi Sunak, in an interview with Harry Cole, the political editor of The Sun, uh, says he could fight the election. Again, it was a lot, there were a lot of provisos. He could fight the election mm. on the threat uh, to, have the, uh, to leave the European Court of Human Rights if his Rwanda plan is thwarted. Look, it's still being delayed and delayed. But God knows when those flights are ever going to take off. If they do... I don't think there'll be a deterrent, even if they do. Yeah. However, um, he has he's basically said that, you know, he could actually fight the election. Not that he would say we are leaving the European Court, that they will leave the European Court. Do you believe that threat? Do you think that's something he's willing to do? No, because he won't be Prime Minister to see it through. So he knows he can uh, look, offer I mean, anything. When Priti Patel first floated to the idea of Rwanda as a, as, a, as a deterrent, people back then, and this was what, 2019, 2020, mm. people back then were saying, no, this would uh, uh, contravene the ECHR, you can't do it. The government has known for a very long time that there will be legal blocks to this, and they are waiting to the very last minute to say, oh, well, if this doesn't happen, we're going to have to do this. It is pure electioneering by a government that knows it's not going to be in power to actually see these things through. Well, we have is... been betrayed. We've been waiting for years for them to do something. They knew the whole time it wasn't going to work. And right at the end, they're going, well, you've got to vote for us because otherwise it's not going to happen. People aren't buying it. There's, to, a, to a certain extent, there's an argument of sort of, you know, you don't want it to actually happen beforehand because then you can still claim it as something yeah. you're going to do. But I mean, the, 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 the intro on, on the front page is, you know, Britain will quit the European Court if that is what it takes to stop small boats. Rishi Sunak promised Sun readers last night. Um, he, for the first time in his premiership, the PM threatened to end the UK's 71-year tie to the European Convention of Human Rights. Mm. Um, I believe that border security, he said, and controlling illegal migration is more important than our membership of any foreign court. The reality is, though, yeah, A, unlikely to win the election. We'll come on to that in a moment. But B, the, the, the fact that actually in terms of the coalition that the, the Conservative Party is, and all political yeah. parties are coalitions to a certain extent, many on the sort of the... They were told the moderate left of the party. I, mean, I don't think them, but I think a lot of their views are extreme, actually. You know, men can become women and things like that. Mm. Pretty bloody extremist view, in my view. It's not certainly with the view of the, the moderate Middle England view. Um, that they would be horrified by that. Yeah. Um, I, I don't think, even if the Tories got elected on that pledge, mm. they'd ever do it. I don't think they would either. I think it's a very difficult thing to sell, actually leaving the, the CHR, because everybody I'd loves do it the... tomorrow. Lots, well, I would as well, but the problem as is... As if we, we never had human rights until we had the European but Court. The, no, no one had human rights I'm here. In favor, I'm in favour of us leaving it. I think it's outdated. I think it could much better be done by a domestic uh, court. It's too, it's too open but to interpretation it is, by individuals. But, uh, yeah, it is fundamentally as sort of at odds with the British legal system. However, I also don't trust this government to actually bring, bring us something better. That's no. part of my real concern. And it's the same with the Labour Party as well. Let's say that they, you know, the, the Tories tried to leave in a hurry and then it was left to the Labour Party to come up with something better. I don't trust either of the political parties to actually come up with something no. sane and feasible. Because, I'll tell you why, because fundamentally, you can see this from mm. the legal visas that have been offered, 745,000 yeah. in 2022 is the latest figures, and it will have gone down slightly for 2023. But, but, you know, that's legal visas that have been given. Mm. It's not people having to come on channel migrant boats, you know, um, that they don't believe in cutting immigration. Now, the, no. there is a, look, there is a popular demographic issue that is coming up in, in the next, you know, uh, you know, 50 years where you're going to have a lot more older people alive mm. and a lot fewer younger people being, you know, babies being born and young people entering the workforce. And we are going to need a stronger workforce. But you know what? Let's pick and choose who we have. And here's an idea. Why don't we make it easier for young people in this country to have as many children as they want so they can afford to do that with their wages? They can afford the housing mm. for that. Most people I know have had fewer children than they would have liked to have had because they can't afford a home, they can't afford a bigger car, they can't afford nursery fees. So bringing in loads more people, putting more pressure on public services, um, and then net, most of these people are net takers, not net contributors yep. when it comes to the tax take, doesn't actually help us with the problem. What we need to do is enable, not encourage, 
enable young women and young men to have as many children as they want to have. Absolutely. And it must be said, this isn't just a Western thing. As you pointed out, this is almost I I global. I don't... I mean, there Japan are very... and China are facing this well, even more than us. What I was going to say is what's very interesting about how Southeast Asian and East Asian countries are dealing with it is not through importing lots of people. They're embracing automation. They're saying, oh, we're not going to have enough people to work in factories and public transports. That's fine because the technology that yep. we are investing in will actually solve that issue. Yeah. And that's what I don't understand about Western countries. We Our attitude that. is to import people Im to work on subsistence wages. Import more wages. cheap labour. Yeah, rather than actually embrace the future. You want to know why China, the next century is China's, and also, to be fair, Japan and Korea, they have very bright futures because they embrace that progress. I, don't, I disagree don't. with you on, uh, on, on Japan. and I, think, I still think America is still going to be... It's, America there's so is, many different reasons. Yeah, America but... is always going to be the... It would take something catastrophic for the Chinese to actually overtake them, but in terms of a region, Europe yeah. has been left behind, ultimately. Yeah. And, oh, totally. and we have to say, so has Canada, so has uh, Mexico. The United States will stand alone against yeah. Asia for the next century. Absolutely. But nonetheless... That's what they're inheriting. But again, these are embracing. the sort of issues that, you know, we need this long-term thinking. We need to, I, get, I, I think we need to have, you know, I love, you know, Reform UK want to have a, 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 a referendum on a net zero. I think we should have a referendum on immigration and discuss the pros and cons mm. and decide who do we want to have. And I, again, I would make a strong argument, you know, we could actually, we could beef our own population up yeah. with, with our own people having, having children, people who are already here. But also, um, you know, let's pick and choose people from countries where people share our values, share our culture and mm. can integrate more quickly. And I'm I'm sorry, I think that I think it's crazy for anyone to think any differently. Um, let's also talk about what will happen in the next election, because according to the latest YouGov poll, um, Labour are forecast to win a majority of 154, uh, a landslide over a over 400 seats mm. at the next general election. Uh, basically, double the number the Conservatives achieved with Boris Johnson in 2019. We are looking at 1997-style uh, a, a landslide. Yeah. Bearing in mind. Of course, Labour are far more ahead in the polls right now than Tony Blair was in 1997. Mm. In fact, a lot, this is one of those little known facts. In 1997, the Tories had a bigger vote share in 97 than they did in 92. Mm. But still, it's because it's the way the seats are distributed. But we are looking at, a, you know, the sort of wipeout that Jeremy Corbyn led Labour to in 2019, Rishi Sunak leading the Tories to. Now, never say never, things can change, but... This puts a different slant on what Tory MPs might do in coming months, doesn't it? It does, and I think a lot of this actually is self-fulfilling. The Tory party is lying down on the railroad tracks and going, <laughs> all right, fine, you know... Well, what honestly, should we do when we lose? It, that seems it, to be... And the it, that's, I, find that, I find that appalling, frankly, that you know, elected MPs are basically saying, right, well, I'm going to either jump ship or I'm going to be looking for five years' time. I think that that attitude is appalling. The Labour Party is going to win not because it's particularly popular, but because the Tories are, A, unpopular, and B, refuse to do anything, actually, to get their, their, themselves in gear. And you mentioned it right there, the divisions within the party. There are some people who would rather, in the Tory party, would rather see it lose than actually see it do something popular and beneficial to the country because it doesn't quite align with popular. their non-Tory. I mean, populist is a, is a dirty word. I've never understood this. It just means popular. It means what people the, want. The same people. But you've got to remember, we're the public. Yeah. We, we're stupid. We're, we're bigoted, racist. We voted for Brexit. We mm. don't know what we're doing. If only, you know, uh, we, they, could have a, they could have votes. You get more votes if you've got a PhD. Yeah. The sort I of mean, people you know. who will actually, with a straight face, say that we need to stop populism to protect democracy. And that's what I'm saying. You go, all oh, right. Lol. Yeah, yeah exactly. Sense. But yeah, Labour are going to win. You, so. you, well, okay. I think I think most people, even a year ago, I would have said, you know what, I think the Tories could sneak in under the wire and might maybe a minority government yeah. uh, because the polls are so soft for Labour. Mm. It's not a, oh, my God, I love this kiss. Oh, my God, I can't wait for him to be prime minister. He's going to change the nation. Mm. He ain't going to change the country for the better. No. There, there's no question at all about that in, that in my mind. I don't even think many people have, in his shadow cabinet think he's going to do much to change. There's going to be no money. Nope. Exactly the same external circumstances exist. We've got the same issues with housing, with... Mm -hmm. uh, you know, energy, but there is nothing that changes other than to get worse yeah. because of Labour being obsessed with net zero more, uh, wanting higher immigration and mm. things like that. So things are going to get worse, not better. However, however, there is still the issue that the polls show a huge number of don't knows and won't says. And the support for, for the Labour is is very tenuous. Would another leader, we've asked this same times, but would another leader make a difference? Well, that's why I say it's unforgivable that the Tories are lying down in the face of the oncoming defeat and going, well, it's a fait accompli. There is the potential, if not to win, then certainly to make life very uncomfortable for Labour. Uh, and I think actually at this moment in time, lots of people have been saying for a long time, oh, you can't get rid of the leader because it's another leadership contest. Actually, he is that unpopular now. 
Rishi Sunak is that unpopular. He's not going to motivate anybody to come. No. You might as well roll the dice because you're not going to lose support at this point. The only people that are left are the, that are left are the die-hard Tory voters yep. who will never abandon the party. So you might as well, you know, gamble roll the dice. On this. Interesting. I mean, one thing that people are roll the dice is, is with their health at the moment. Just finally, the NHS mm. waiting list. Uh, we we know we've been hearing about this sort of, you know, seven point uh, six million figure of people waiting um, on, on on the waiting list uh, for appointments of some kind. Uh, we're now told there could be another two million people. This is according to new data from the Office for National Statistics. Uh, a survey of more than 100,000 adults found that you know, one in five of them waiting for an NHS appointment, waiting mm. for a test or some sort of medical treatment. Um, so when the NHS does those lists, they don't include like people waiting for follow-up appointments or checkups because they've already started a programme of treatment. However, you know, you've got the GP appointment, you've got your appointment to meet your consultant, mm. but after that point, you might be waiting two months for the next thing. Those people are still waiting. They ain't being treated. They're, They're unfortunately not the king of England or the future queen of England, so they don't get treated as quickly. And I'm sorry, that is the reality in this country. Yeah. Um, this is terrifying, and this is the sort of thing that governments quite rightly, mm. lose elections on. Absolutely. And I mean, look, we've had an eight, we've known for a long time, as you said, demographic bomb that's hitting us, an ageing population combined with an expanding population, and we haven't been increasing capacity to meet that. You would think that one of the key things that governments would do would plan for this eventuality. Mm. All that this government has done is panic at the last minute and say, OK, more visas for overseas medics. Yeah. And that doesn't Brilliant. actually increase capacity at all, especially when half of your doctors are leaving because they're underpaid and they can go to Australia or Canada. Yeah. Absolutely. Weirdly, because they want to protect the NHS and they go to Australia and Canada where they don't have... Where they're privatised. Yes. yes. <laughs> oh, the irony, womp, because womp. we have... Wah, wah, wah. <laughs>